Why shouldst thou die before thy time? Or, Divine Healing, by Grace G. Henry. Chapter 1, The Healing of Man by God. The precious story of the Son of God, who gave himself that he might purchase redemption from sin, by taking our place on the cross, never grows old. All down the generations, even up until today its drawing power is bringing hope to poor benighted souls lost in sin. It is in fact, the grand theme of God's holy book. The wonder of it all is that men seem to be content to stop with this blessing and have failed to consider all that our Heavenly Father left us in His will. The prophets spoke of healing and redemption. When Jesus walked on earth He filled His days with the multitudes who pressed in. And we are told that He healed all manner of diseases and healed all who came to Him during His lifetime. And He said unto them, In parting with them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And one of the very signs that they were sent of God was, verse 18, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, Mark 16, 15. And so in the history of the church we find divine healing prominent. There seemed to be no question of accepting this part of the gospel message at that time. One day a lame man lay at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. Peter took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and we are told they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. Acts 3, 7, 9. While preaching at Lystra Paul saw a crippled man who gave evidence of having faith for healing and he spoke loudly, stand up right on thy feet. And he leaped and walked, this among pagans who knew not God. Later, Paul boldly went in to pray for the father of Publius on the island of Melita, laying his hands on him and God healed him, and, seeing this, others came and were healed. Here, on this pagan island healing, came before the message of salvation was heard. So, we find Christ healing, then in the early church, the saints also as they went about taking care of the master's business of healing the sick. Moreover, there is simply no place in the Bible where we are told that healing through prayer and faith is to cease in the church. Even to this day there is no one thing that draws attention to the evidence of the presence of God among men as much as a real case of healing from above. There is something so miraculous and awe-inspiring of a higher power that it seems to prepare the heart of mankind for the message of God's great saving power. Chapter 2. Why shouldst thou die before thy time? The psalmist says, the number of our years are three score years and ten, Psalm 90 10, and this is the average lifespan of a normal man. Since then, seventy years is the lifespan the Christian may well look forward to living by having a clean, normal life and by trusting in God and his promises to live out his days. Do we say that every Christian can and will attain 70 years of life? No. Nowhere can we find proof of this in the word of God. But we read, our times are in his hand, and we hear the cry of the psalmist, Take me not away in the midst of my days. Psalm 102.24, why? Because he desires to fulfill his allotted time of life. And again, we read, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish, why shouldst thou die before thy time? The inference here, plainly is that it is possible for a man, by wickedness or foolishness, and we also contend by lack of faith in God's healing power, to die in the midst of their days and not at the end. One of the promises given to Israel by God was that if they would be faithful and obey they should live out their time. I will take sickness away from thee, the number of thy days will I fulfill. Exodus 23, 25, 26. When E. Faith Stewart was pastor of the Park Place Church in Anderson, Indiana many years ago, she fell seriously ill and so continued until hope for her recovery was practically given up. As she lay talking to God one day she was reminded to read Psalm 91 15, 16. But she could not call the verses to mind just then. She asked one of her friends, who happened to be attending her at that time to sit down and read those verses and beginning at verse 15, she read, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble, I will honor him. Honor whom? The man who really puts his trust in God. Verse 16, with long life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. In these verses God plainly says that he will answer the prayer of faith of those that call upon him and trust him. First, one, he will be with him in trouble. Two, he will deliver him from the trouble and honor him. Three, he will give that person a long life. Four, he will reveal to him the riches and power of the salvation life. Praise God! Did he do that in the case of Faith Stewart? He did. This was the promise he turned her attention to and he kept every part of those two verses of the 91st Psalm. She lived until 80 years and saw the riches and power of his salvation and died in victory 10 years after the allotted time of life. We hope that our readers will forgive us if we bear testimony of a personal case in our own life to bear upon this thought of length of life for those who will cast their cases wholly upon him and lay hold on the promises of his word. 
It happened during our pastorate in New Philadelphia, Ohio, perhaps about 1941. One Sunday evening we were preaching on the subject of divine healing and urging the saints to trust God to the limit, for all and to believe the promises, when it seemed as if a voiceless voice said, Would you trust God only if you were at the point of death? As I continued to preach to the saints, I also answered God, I have never been at the point of death and I do not know, Lord, but I would do my best to trust to the end. Two or more weeks, slipped by in a call, came from the church, in alliance to come the following Sunday and preach there in the absence of the pastor. Since my husband consented to fill the pulpit at home for the day, I went over as agreed. That morning I preached under great difficulty and shortly after dinner, had a severe heart attack. I spent the afternoon in bed and practically took my life in my own hands by preaching again that evening. I returned home sick and soon was compelled to take to bed. It was a serious case right from the start. I grew steadily worse and after a short time a young lady of the congregation came to stay with me. One evening she asked the privilege of having her own personal physician come to me, saying he was just outside the door. Consent was given with a reminder that we would be examined but would continue to trust God only. He came in and soon gave his verdict. You have preached your last sermon, he said. It is the worst case of both heart and nerves I ever examined. He gave no hope of recovery. At first I felt very badly, and then the thought came to me, I did not send for this man. He is not my physician. I need not accept his opinion of my case. The weeks drew on, and so sick was I that only those who had to come in to care for me ever came in and their presence seemed to affect me. I lay there, in that room five long months, with my heart, getting weaker and weaker. The blood was not getting through as it ought. One day it seemed that every nerve of my body hurt and being in such a weak state it seemed I could not bear it. I asked my husband to please go uptown and buy a small electric heating pad, hoping the extra heat might ease my pain. But while he was dressing to go, the Lord definitely spoke to me thus, Cannot I relieve this pain without a heating pad, as well as heal you of this sickness? Can't you trust me for this also? So, all I could do was to ask him to take the money, $5, to our missionary president as a thank offering, giving $2.50 to the home and $2.50 to foreign missions. Has the pain left? He asked. No, I said, but I know God will take it away for you will not deceive me. When he went to the home a lady was there visiting. My husband stated his errand. Then the lady said, let me lend you my electric heating pad. I have a much bigger and better one than a $5 one. But when it was offered, we turned it down. We felt that God did not want us to use any help, because he had too plainly spoken. That particular pain soon left, though we were still seriously ill. Again, through suffering there came a time when we could not sleep. Our nerves were so tense that three nights slipped by and all became concerned. The woman who was caring for me asked her physician to come and again we told him on arrival that we were trusting our case in God's hands. He was far from pleased and after examination calmly said I was past recovery and laid down some tablets to aid sleep. Please do not leave them, I said, for I will not be taking them and they will be just wasted. But he, insisting on my taking them, walked away. That night the battle for sleep went on as before. Seriously sick, worn out for want of sleep, so badly needed, we began our talk with God to complain, Father, I said, if I had a child who needed sleep so badly, I would give it to him. Then my Heavenly Father spoke clearly in the night. Can I not heal you without sleep? Of course. Why had we worried so about the loss? God is master of all situations. Yes, Lord. I do believe you can, and I will just lie here and await your will. So the consequence was that for the first time, in four nights we grew less tense and sleep, less sleep, came. And then came the crisis of that long and terrible sickness. Looking back, I remember not saying anything but perhaps my agony showed in my face. But that night my husband came and sat quietly by my bedside. It seemed as if my heart was having spasm after spasm and all organs surrounding it were quivering in sympathy with it. Finally, so great, became the agony that I did not want to live. With life at the lowest ebb and no relief, in hours of this agony within, suddenly I turned my face from my husband and in spite of the effort it cost me, turned toward the wall. But God spoke definitely, to me spoke in reproach, and Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. In all my sickness my mind was as clear as ever in my life. At that moment I recalled the whole story of Hezekiah, and I knew that in spite of the agony within, God was somehow displeased with me because I was no longer fighting to live on. I turned back and again started the struggle to live on. For four long months the battle had gone on to live, to hold on in spite of suffering and weariness. With another month, came the annual camp meeting at Anderson, Indiana. I asked my husband to take me there, and I would be healed. He replied that I would die on the road. 
But, I replied, I will die happy, knowing I'm seeking healing. So at last, lying on pillows in the back seat of our car, I was taken to camp. Ministers in the area around my home had come at different times to anoint and pray for me during the long siege but I knew that these good men also relied on other help, and though I tried honestly to have confidence in their prayers, it had all failed. Then after arriving at camp, an elderly couple from a northern state laid their hands on me and prayed the prayer of faith and I was healed instantly. I started up and walked over the grounds. Suddenly a strange sensation in the region of my heart caused me to stop and consider. It seemed as if my heart was swelling and about to burst. Then I thought, I have put this case in God's hands. I have nothing to worry about. I am healed. The night that I had turned my face to the wall and was rebuked by God for it, I took heart and asked God for 15 years, the same as Hezekiah did. At that time I was 55 years old and 15 more years would just bring me to 70 years or my allotted time.